Well, welcome. We've got Christopher Black with me uh, today, and I'm very pleased to have Christopher's company. Um, he's a respected international defense lawyer and a, an international legal authority. He's acted as a, as a defense counsel at the United Nations war crime tribunals in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Um, Christopher Black has criticized the politicization of international justice and the abuse of international law by the United States and its NATO allies. We're going to discuss a summit that occurred this week in Taiwan. Uh, it was organized by the US-based National Endowment for Democracy, the NED. The summit was titled uh, the uh, World Democracy uh, Movement, uh, the promotion of, quote, world democracy in Taiwan. At the summit, there was something like 300 democracy activists, so described as democracy activists, attending this summit. And they came from about 70 countries, according to the NED's website. The summit happened on the October 25th, 26th and 27th. The National Endowment for Democracy, the organizer of the summit, described it as a, a forum to discuss, and I'm quoting here, to discuss how to counter today's authoritarian challenges and help foster democratic momentum. Quite a loaded phrase there, if we can pick, pick that apart. Um, and the summit had a special focus, uh, and that was on the link Taiwan and Ukraine as two major front lines of the struggle for democracy today. So I'm going to uh, talk with uh, Christopher Black about this summit and related issues. And I'd like to ask you, Christopher, um, the, uh, what is the legal status of Taiwan, the territory of Taiwan? What is the legal status of Taiwan under international UN law? Uh, uh, thanks, Vinny, for having me on your, on your program and uh, discussing this issue. It's a uh, the legitimate, the, the legal status of Taiwan is that it's a province of China. It's part of, the, of China has been recognized as such since 1940s when the Chiang Kai-shek um, Republic of China was the official government of China during the civil fighting the Japanese and the civil war between them and the communist forces. <clears throat> in 1949, when the communist forces won the civil war, uh, the Kaomintang under Chiang Kai-shek, his forces fled to Taiwan as the last remaining province that was not under the control of the, of the communist government. And they were assisted in, in leaving and escaping to Taiwan by, with the U.S. Naval, Navy ships and assistance. They then set up a government in Taipei, which claimed to be the only legitimate government of China as a whole. And that was their official position until 1971, according to the United States and even the U.N., because when the United Nations was created in 1946 or so, the seat occupied by China was uh, taken by representatives of Chiang Kai-shek's government. And they claimed to be the sole legitimate government of China, not the communist government in Beijing. Um, in fact, Russia tried to, the Chinese, the communists tried to uh, get that seat in 1950 and the Russians backed that. And that was the reason that the Russians were not in the room when the, um, the uh, United States and its allies voted to uh, commit UN forces, so-called really NATO forces, to attack Korea and China in 1950. Uh, because Russia was absent and it boycotted the meeting in order to try and force the United, the United States to let the, the communist government of China take the seat at the UN. And because they, and so the, valid, the vote in the UN was not valid because they were absent. Anyway, <clears throat> so tai, uh, Taipei maintained that seat until July 1971, I believe, and then uh, finally the world recognized that the communist government of Beijing was the legitimate sole government of China and recognized it as such finally officially by the UN and in a resolution it was uh, Taipei representatives kicked out and the representatives from Beijing came in. And it's been that way ever since. But there was still no dispute that Taiwan was part of China, and that was still the official position of the Kuomintang forces in Taiwan. They still claimed to be the, the legitimate government of China. 
And in mm -hmm. fact, that is the American position till today. Many people say there's a contradiction between the American promotion of Taiwan's sovereignty or independence, so-called, and its, its official status, maintaining its official status that uh, Taiwan is part of China. But it's because they really do see um, the Taiwanese forces, the Kuomintang forces, as uh, a Trojan horse to try and overthrow the communist government in Beijing. And therefore, mm -hmm. if Taiwan actually became a separate country, they wouldn't be able to claim that because there'd be a mm -hmm. separate country. But as long so as they're part of China, they're, they're, a, they're a, a government in waiting, waiting to take over and kick out the communists. That's what the plan is. Yeah. So Taiwan so, is part of China. It always has been and is still recognized as, as one country, not two. Yeah. I mean, in, in the UN, Christopher, the, the one China principle prevailed, and that that stipulates that Taiwan is an integral part of China, the People's Republic of China. Taiwan is, could we say, maybe uh, analogous to Hawaii in relation to the United States. It's it's a, a part of the of China's territory uh, under Ch Beijing's um, central government's authority. So, in that case, having a, a conference in China's territory, organized by the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a, a US government funded agency, and we'll talk a wee bit more about its uh, more shady aspects in a minute. But to have a conference organized in Chinese sovereign territory by the US sponsored uh, gov uh, government agency, the NED, is quite a controversial event in itself, isn't it? It is because. The NED, if you, if you look at the uh, the purpose of their purpose generally, and the purpose of the meeting in Taipei, it was to to fight against authoritarianism, communism, and and everything else. They really, it's really an attempt to promote the government of Taipei as legitimate government of of China. It's really assisting um, renegade groups located in Taiwan uh, and, mm -hmm. and against the legitimate government of China. It's in fact, it's entry, mm -hmm. it's entry into Chinese politics, internal affairs. It's mm -hmm. supporting a renegade, renegade forces still existing in Taiwan and promoting them as legitimate government against the real government. So mm -hmm. it's instigating, in fact, civil war and instigated any, uh, attempts to overthrow the government in Beijing. That's what it's all about. And no, no, mm. no, the United States would not tolerate that if forces outside came into Hawaii and tried to back Hawaiian independence forces, because they do exist. <laughs> you know yes. what would happen to them very, right quick. So, yeah, yeah. We, we, we can imagine the ructions, the uproar that that would cause. But yet it's quite amazing that the 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 arrogance, the presumption of of the American uh, government and its uh, organization, the National Endowment for Democracy, to even, you know, hold an event in China to, uh, quote, promote democracy against authoritarian uh, challenges. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty much a, a head-on um, provocation to, to China's authority and sovereignty, isn't it? It is. It's, many people don't seem to understand that. It really is the United States entering in, going into China itself and supporting a rebel group against the religion of government. And the only reason mm -hmm. that China can't do anything about it directly right now is because of the distance across the sea. Otherwise, if that was taking place in Shanghai or somewhere, they would just raid that meeting and arrest everybody. Mm -hmm. But they can't mm -hmm. do that because of the physical separation of the province by sea. And so they'd have mm -hmm. to be a military force to do that. They don't want to do that unless they're really forced to do that because why, why, why have a war? You don't need one. But yeah, it's a deliberate propagation, propag a provocation against China and um, interference in their internal affairs. And the arrogance goes so far that when they call themselves a national endowment for democracy, we know that what they really mean by democracy is American capitalism. They don't mean what well, you and I think of democracy. Uh, that's just as a cover for American capitalism. It's an imperialist phrase they've, a phrase they've adopted to cover for imperialism. Mm -hmm. And they claim that they're supporting 
democracy in Taiwan, well, we have to remember that up until from 1949 to 1992, Taiwan was a one-party military dictatorship during which in those years, I believe 140,000 people were executed or disappeared because they supported communists, communist groups, trade unions, and other organizations which were considered to be left wing. There was no democracy in Taiwan until 1992. And then when this whole wave of, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Americans began bragging about supporting democracy everywhere, they had to change their tune a bit, make it look good. So they, the government in Taipei, the Kuomintang, they, they broke into two pieces, the Democratic Progressive Party and the Kuomintang. So there's now two parties in Taipei, but no others, no left-wing parties. They're both factions of the same group. Mm -hmm. uh, Although the Kalman tongue is a bit, strangely enough, a bit more ready to talk to Beijing than the other side. But <clears throat> um, the so you, you you had no real democracy in 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 uh, Taiwan. No no socialist parties can be formed. No real labor unions can be formed. Students can't demonstrate, and so on and so forth. And in then they mentioned Ukraine in the same boat. Well, we know that the United States does not support democracy in Ukraine. They suppressed democracy in Ukraine in 2014. Well, actually, before that, in 2010, when the Orange Revolution. Then 2014, the Maidan so-called uh, Butch, which was a NATO stage coup, with NATO members or, or soldiers were involved in that coup. Uh, they overthrew the elected government of Yanukovych in Ukraine and imposed a puppet regime composed, for the large part, <laughs> with outright Nazis. And they've been supporting mm -hmm. that regime ever since, which is not recognized by the provinces of eastern Ukraine, which is now have rebelled in 2014 against them and refused to acknowledge them. And that's what this war is yeah. all about. So the NED has been involved, and they brag about it, in suppressing democracy everywhere yeah. in the world, from Yugoslavia, yeah. we'll name every country in the world, but that's what it's about. And everything else is kind of for that matter. It's kind of an Orwellian doublespeak, isn't it? Promoting democracy, but actually suppressing democracy. And good of you to, to, to bring up Ukraine, uh, you know, in the connection to this. I mean, the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, were majorly involved in that uh, coup uh, and the new regime in Kiev in 2014. The NED played a instrumental role in facilitating that uh, seizure of power, that uh, coming to power of that regime that is... is existing till today so the ned christopher i mean it's uh it's got some reputation for those who who know about it uh, unfortunately a lot of people don't seem to know about it and they take it at face value as the national endowment for democracy something virtuous but tell, tell us a wee bit more about the ned its origins and 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 its more shady um connections to uh, U.S. government, deep state kind of um, planners? It, well, it was formed um, in um, 1983 after Ronald Reagan presented the idea in a speech in London, the famous speech he made in Parliament in London about promoting democracy everywhere. Um, up until then, most American government interventions in anti-communist groups in socialist countries and so on, and subversive groups and around the world were conducted by the CIA and other intelligence services covertly. Um, I think Lyndon Johnson objected to that, wanted it to be placed in some open agency where it's done openly. Uh, Ronald Reagan promoted the idea and then in 1983 it was, it was presented to Congress. So the NED was founded by an act of Congress and yet it claims mm -hmm. to be a non-government organization, but it was founded by an act of Congress, supported by both parties. Its entire uh, program is regulated by the US Congress on a yearly basis, audited by them. Mm -hmm. uh, its staff and its board of directors came from US State Department departments and government de departments. Uh, its present president, Damon Wilson, uh, is a former uh, U.S. State Department hack who is involved in, he claims, expanding NATO east <laughs> to counter Russia. 
Uh, he was uh, worked in Iraq at the and the embassy there when the American invasion and occupation took place and they destroyed Iraq. He has mm -hmm. worked for NATO later on, NATO headquarters. Uh, he worked. He works then relating for the Atlantic Council. He's advised many presidents. He's an, he's an American government a figure and, a, and an important one. So mm -hmm. he's now made president of this so-called non-governmental organization. If you, but if you look at all the staff, the board of directors and where they come from, they all come from American State Department uh, careers, uh, military careers, uh, American uh, uh, government-sponsored think tanks like the Atlantic or NATO think tanks like the Atlantic Council and other uh, and American Enterprise Institute and all these things. <clears throat> There's a whole mm -hmm. web of these organizations from which they draw their people. Mm -hmm. um, so they claim, but yet it claims to be a non-government organization, non-profit, non-government. But it is, it is a non-profit. But it, it is a, it is a, a specifically American government organization. Mm -hmm. All its funding is fund comes from the American Congress. There's no private yep. funding that I'm aware of. And it's not an exaggeration, Chris, to say that the NED is a a front for the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. I mean, it's not a hyperbole to describe it as such, as, as a front. Um, would you agree? Right. It's a, a lot of, many of its members also have gone through the CIA or other intelligence services like the State Department, Research Bureau, and other agencies or other secret agencies they have there. Um, but yes, everything it does is directed by the U.S. government, by the CIA and other intelligence, National Security Council and everybody else. All the intelligence agencies are involved in its work and direct its work because when, you see that when the uh, Americans invaded uh, Iraq in 2003, suddenly there was a whole shift of focus of the NED towards the Middle East and setting up social society, in, uh, open society groups along with George Soros in these countries to try and influence people there to go along with their invasion. And they did the mm -hmm. same in Ukraine, as you said, you did the same in Taiwan. So whenever the mm -hmm. focus shifts to an area, you see that NED going along with that shift directly and setting up organizations, a sub a whole web of myriad of organizations to try and control the situation in those regions. So they, yeah. Yeah, they do it covertly, they pretend to be de de for democracy, but they're always, have a, some other pur ulterior purpose. A, a, a good um, a good description that Will, William um, Blum came up with. You know William Blum, the the late uh, American socialist, anti-imperialist writer. Uh, he's dead now. A couple of years back, he, he died uh, sadly. Um, but uh, um, William Blum had a, a, a great uh, phrase for the NED. He called them the the CIA's Trojan horse. You yeah, know, to, well, that's a very good point because that's what, what he, he, yeah. Or, because if you would know the CIA was going to be involved directly, you wouldn't maybe, governments wouldn't let them in. But when it's disguised as a social society group, a pro democracy group, you sort of have to let them in, or you're criticized for not for being against democracy. Yeah, it's a hard it's, way. <laughs> it was a smart move. It was a smart kind of makeover or public relations exercise. In fact, uh, William Blum described it as a masterpiece to, to, to launder the CIA's image in a more palatable form right. under the, the name National uh, Endowment for Democracy. As, as Blum said himself, you know, during the 60s and 70s, the, the CIA were badly discredited through its involvement in assassinations and uh, regime change operations and, and overthrowing governments. And you had a uh, various um, congressional inquiries into the activities of the CIA, including the assassination of John F. Kennedy and, uh, and other figures around the world like Patrick Lumumba uh, in the Congo and um, many other uh, figures. And these congressional inquiries, like the church, is, is the, the Senate inquiry led by Frank Church, exposed a lot of the dirty tricks of the CIA. I mean, real, real heavy criminal activities, assassinations, and what have you. And um, with that, with those kind of revelations, the CIA was badly damaged. Its its image was was you know uh, completely you know destroyed uh, to say the least. And, and then. 
as a way of reinventing itself or to, to revamp its image, it, uh, this is where the NED came in then in 1983, as you pointed out, Christopher. And um, so it, it was a way of the CIA repackaging itself and garnering a new image so that it could carry on its nefarious right. activities right. of subverting governments and infiltrating under the guise, of course, of how could you contest the promotion of democracy, you know, uh, right. if you're gullible enough. So this is the you know, this is the pedigree or, or the function, the history of the NED. Getting back to the, the present then, Christopher, so we, we see the NED organizing a conference under the guise of promoting democracy in China this very week. Uh, this conference um, held in, in, in Taiwan, which as you point out is officially Chinese territory. So it is quite an audacious uh, provocation and, uh, you know, entry into Chinese political internal affairs. It is, and uh, I'll be, in fact, the last nine months or a year, the United States has been adding one provocation on top of another. Um, and it looks like they're trying to provoke China into some sort of military response so they can react. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but China is more patient than they believe, <laughs> they thought. Um, but yeah. there, come, there is always a limit to how much you can be provoked without reacting at some point. <clears throat> and they, I think they're going to keep keep up these provocations and try and push and push and push until there is a reaction. Uh, how far the Chinese can, can be patient mm -hmm. and buy their time until they're ready for that, we don't, well, we, should, we shall see. <clears throat> but and a major... Christopher, a major, a major part of the provocation, sorry for interrupting you, but a major part of the provocation are, are these massive arms sales that are being, um, you know, executed almost on a yearly basis by the administrations, regardless of whether the Democrat or Republican uh, administrations, the Obama, Trump, now Biden administrations are, are just pumping Taiwan with massive arms sales. I think there's a, a measure going through the Senate right now where they're planning to um, sell, sell something like $6.5 billion worth of weapons over the next four years. That's, that's going through the Senate right now. That's on top of numerous massive arms packages, as, as I said, from the Obama administration through to Trump. Now, in the uh, Biden administration. So this is one provocation after another, and it's the context for now this summit that happened in, in the last few days. It's 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 not just an isolated, um, ill-thought-out uh, you know, project to have a, a conference in Taiwan uh, by the NED. It's part of a deliberate, concerted um, campaign to, to provoke Beijing's fury uh, to pro pro provoke a reaction. Um, yeah, it, yes. it, 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 we have to tie this in with, um, for instance, the arrest of Meng Wanzhou in Canada on American orders. The last three years she was held, she was released a few months back. <clears throat> she was held here incommunicado <laughs> on trumped up charges and uh, Canada went along with that. Um, that was a provocation against China because mm -hmm. she's the chief executive financial officer of Huawei and a very influential figure. But then you have um, the other movements for democracy, the summit for democracy, the one in, in Copenhagen in last summer, and you had follow up the summit of democracy in, United, in Washington after that. And this mm -hmm. democracy summit or meeting in uh, Taipei is part of that whole web of summits for democracy they're all focused on russia and china a lot on china you look at their their talks always focused on the authoritarian china what they mean is socialist china they're against social these are right-wing reactionaries you can even call them fascists if you wish but they're they they work for big capital trying to crush anything where working people and progressive people can form a society where <laughs> reason and, and humanity control the governments they want profit to control the government, and that's what it's all about. Um, mm. So, so they, it, go ahead. Mm. It, it puts in perspective. They're trying to overthrow. I mean, they want to overthrow the communist 
They don't care about democracy in China. What they care about is destroying democracy in China by overthrowing the socialist or communist regime, government in China and eliminating mm -hmm. it. And then they will reduce China back to what it was in the 1930s. Yeah, the, the century of humiliation when the Western powers just um, absolutely subjugated China. Um, so it puts it all this, Christopher. Uh, thanks for your 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 great survey of of the geopolitics around Taiwan and China, and it puts in perspective these accusations from Washington. And just this week, again, more accusations of China China's aggression, China's expansionism. You had the Pentagon releasing this um, national defense strategy uh, paper um, this week, and in that it. Um, it nominates China as the uh, the main long-term threat for the United States and accuses China of all sorts of nefarious kind of aggression, aggressive um, ambitions it, it, towards China, uh, sorry, ta Taiwan in particular. From what you've just said in the last half hour, it really puts in perspective the, the absurdity of these accusations that Washington is making against China considering the, the aggression that Washington is perpetrating against China through uh, the Trojan horse of the NED and arms sales to, to Taiwan. Yes, I mean, we have to remember that the United States attacked China in 1950. I think that was the main purpose of the attack on North Korea, it was to try to overthrow the communist government in Beijing in, in 1950. Mm -hmm. They failed, they were defeated, the Americans were defeated. And um, they attacked China again directly in 1999 when they attacked Yugoslavia for several months and destroyed all the infrastructure. People forget what happened in Yugoslavia. But they, they fired five cruise missiles at the Chinese embassy and killed several staffers. They intended to kill the ambassador, but the, I was told when I was there that the cruise missile, which is aimed at his quarters, failed to explode. That's why he survived. Mm -hmm. That was a direct attack on China. In 1999, mm -hmm. that's not long ago, and the Chinese yeah. have not forgotten that. So, mm -hmm. and then with Trump and the so-called aggression, that China, what is China's aggression? China's not attacking anybody. China doesn't have any bases anywhere, except one in Djibouti, <laughs> across from the Foreign Legion base and the American base, which is, yeah. um, but they don't have any, they're not, they're not acting aggressively against anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. Americans are losing their economy, even though it's the language they close them, clothe themselves with. They're basically gangsters. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. say, that's what the world's dealing with. Yes, Chris. And um, I mean, do you think, Christopher, that the, the provocations coming from Washington, the concerted, systematic provocations, year after year after year, administration after administration, administration do you think that the, the the washington's objective really is to provoke an armed conflict with china over taiwan it looks that way i mean one has to wonder what kind of insanity reigns in washington and the leading circles but when they're fighting a war with russia which is what they're doing trying to start one with iran and also in north korea and they're trying to stir up a war with china but that's I mean, it seems insane that they'd want to fight wars on several fronts at the same time in their clearly weakened position. But that seems to be what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. It may be, many people have said this, but I think it's probably correct. That the United States in its decline is so desperate to try and hang on to what remains of its control of the world or what it thinks is of its control of the world, that it is, it, it's decided this is a crucial or a, crisis, a time of crisis in which it has to act no matter what the dangers are to try and maintain that control, which makes them very dangerous because against all common sense and reason, they are, they are provoking wars in, across the entire globe at this time. And they're talking openly about nuclear war. And with this new um, nuclear policy review they just issued, they've lowered the standard by which, under which they can use nuclear weapons. I mean, they did under their previous review. They 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 claimed the right to be able to use nuclear weapons anytime they see fit, anywhere they want. Now they've lowered it down. They could maybe even use it in when there's no nuclear threat. Just their forces, their interests are gravely concerned or something, mm. which makes you worry about them using nuclear weapons at any time. I mean, 
they used them on Japan. We don't have, as President Putin reminded everybody, it was the Americans that dropped atom, atomic bombs on two civilian cities, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, in 1945, for no other reason except to prove to the Soviet Union they had the power to do that. Yeah. And that's the kind of ruthlessness we are dealing with. So we don't know what, they're capable of anything. And that's what we have to be aware of. Yeah. People that can do that can really do anything. Mm -hmm. We have to be aware of that. Indeed. And that's, I think that everybody, I mean, Russia and China stand up to them, but they always, they're also aware that these people are not exactly rational. Mm -hmm. I was told in, in Moscow once that they were very depressed when the Americans were destroying Libya. Another thing supported by the NED, the murder of Gaddafi. There's a very depressed mood there. And I spoke to some officials high up in the, they told me, I, I said, why are you so depressed? It's because we think the American leadership is completely irrational. They're capable of anything. And that's what we're facing. Now, how yeah. do you deal with something, people like that? Yeah. I think the, the, the hubris and um, arrogance in, in Washington has, has reached a sort of a hyper state where they're beyond rational thinking. They're, they're yeah. so intoxicated with their own self-righteousness and hubris, they're beyond reason. And that's that's very disturbing that they, they just do not seem to be a rational actor. They like to talk about other people as being whether they're rational actors or not. But I think the, the irony is that uh, the, the very disturbing irony is that the, the Washington seems to be bereft of any rational actors beyond just trying to establish their own hegemony and, and dominance over the world, which is, you know, a path to perdition. Um, you know, Chris, I was just going to think, I was just thinking there that um, you know, the, the, the summit that happened this week in Taiwan, um, you know, in a kind of a, a ironic way, they, they linked Taiwan and, and, and Ukraine. Um, and that, that kind of plays in, in another way that, that you know, linkage inadvertently, it does tend to suggest that there is a parallel with the policy of subverting Ukraine, installing an anti-Russian um, regime in Ukraine in 2014, as you, as you mentioned, with the NED's help. <clears throat> and again, we have the NED working on Taiwan and very consciously linking Taiwan with Ukraine. And look how Ukraine is, um, culminated in, in a war with with Russia it does that does suggest a very ver foreboding future for Taiwan that Taiwan is being shipped up to act as a a, a war footing towards China uh, and right. it's really it's, we're on a countdown to when that that will actually uh, materialize <clears throat> yeah it's a, a sad fact that the people that Taiwan may find themselves in the middle of a, of a shooting war, a very severe one. Um, I don't know how that will turn out, but I'm sure that's why the whole world and China in particular are watching what goes on in Ukraine and um, how NATO and the Americans have actually, have really been, have failed in their attempt to uh, crush Russia. Um, mm. And so the United States and NATO are weaker than they pretend to be. Uh, but still, they're dangerous, and if they if if they keep crossing these red lines that China sets down, and they keep whatever whatever red line China sets down, they will they intend to cross it. What when China will call their Trump and say that's it, mm -hmm. they can't take anymore. Um, I don't know what that will be, but it will come a day when uh, that will have to happen. And then, yeah, it'd be terrible with the consequences. And all because, all for no reason whatsoever, because there are forces in, ta in Taiwan and people in the government and business who are quite willing to talk about reunification with, with China. Sorry, not reunification, but accepting direct government control from Beijing and mm -hmm. China, like North Korea says to South Korea. We could get together again. There's no problem. You can maintain your economy. We'll maintain ours. We'll have a federal. And this will work like, um, the same way other countries have done it in different places. Uh, well, they did with Hong Kong, for instance, or Macau. Uh, so there's no problem. It doesn't need to be a problem, <laughs> except that the Americans keep encouraging the, the former Kuomintang forces who were defeated 
they, as, they, as, they, as they keep forcing Zelensky to resist Russia instead of negotiating, and, and when he tries to negotiate, they stop him. When the Taiwanese, the Taipei government, talks about or thinks about becoming friendly and saying, let's, let's have an accommodation and resolve this fight, mm -hmm. they, they stop them. And they provoke yeah. them to take some firmer stance because we're going to back you up. But they obviously, we, we see that with Zelensky, backing him up doesn't mean anything. Zelensky's, you know, Ukraine's a mess. It's being destroyed as we speak. Zelensky is not going to end up in a good place, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, the government in Taipei, the people and the forces in Taipei that will side themselves with the United States are going to be going to regret it. Mm -hmm. People are the ones who are going to suffer, as they always do in these wars. Whereas the Americans are back in, on the continental United States, facing their own problems, and they mm -hmm. won't suffer. Yeah, well said, Chris. I mean, it, it's quite, it's quite. It should be, it should be blatantly obvious who the who is the threat here to world peace, uh, whether it's in the Taiwan Strait or uh, in uh, on Russia's doorstep, the, the threat to, to world peace uh, is quite evidently in Washington. Um, that's 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 the, the very sobering and disturbing uh, reality. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, when the defending president, Milosevic, um, I was shocked at the things that I found out went on when the Americans, when NATO attacked Yugoslavia under a pretext, which the NED, and then finally Milosevic was overthrown in a push, supported by the NED, by the way, and they claim that as an act of democracy, but it's suppression because he had won the elections again. But they threw him out, had him arrested, shipped to uh, The Hague. Um, but during the attack on Yugoslavia, the NATO forces hardly touched the uh, Yugoslavian forces. They weren't successful at all. They sort of began bombing infrastructure. The only, but the, so you ask yourself, so why did then Yugoslavia finally give in to NATO in June of 1999? Well, I was told because they got a, a, a visit from Chernomir and the foreign minister of under Yeltsin of Russia. And Atasari, who was Finnish minister of something, who wanted to know about the peace prize later on, they brought a message to Milosevic from the Americans saying that unless you you give in on surrender, the Americans are going to carpet bomb Belgrade with high-flying B-52s your for Air Forces can't touch, and they intend to kill 500,000 people. We're going to flatten Belgrade unless you surrender. That was their offer. And then Milosevic took that to the parliament and said, this is what they intend to do. Do we continue fighting, which we can do? Or what? Or do we let this happen? So they decided to give in. Yeah. And Milosevic was thrown thrown out a couple of weeks later. Mm -hmm. NATO moved into, in, and the NED supported that. They crushed democracy. They crushed socialism in Yugoslavia. It's Yugoslavia has now ceased to exist. Nobody mentions it. Talk about Serbia or Kosovo. And they will do the same with uh, Ukraine, with Taiwan, with China. They mm -hmm. intend to do the same. Christopher, great to have your knowledge, your your legal insights, your 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 great personal experience of um, fighting against empire um, and to, to have your uh, knowledge being shared with us. We thank you very much, Christopher. Thank uh, you for bringing this to the public and for inviting me on. It's very good. Thank you, Chris.